percentageation of those people to be meaningful, right? And so we, we see this in her work, the symbiotic and dialectic relationship between black suffering and enjoyment of black um, culture. Um, but we also see it with this um, recent uh, growth, uh, economic growth in Latin America, where doing better, the pie growing and everyone getting a big, bigger piece of the pie is just not enough. Um, the idea that the airports have become bus stations and that the empregadas don't want to work anymore um, is premised on this idea that a middle class status is, is about the subjugation of another class, and that class is racialized, right? And so we have to think about uh, the ways in which whiteness functions, not as a logic, of course, but as a performance. And we have to think more about the, the content of it. And in fact, many of these repertoires of protest that we see on the street, um, I think, are showing both overt and, um, and, um, and not so overt ways that, that, that whiteness is configuring itself um, as the patriotic project, right? Um, as, uh, as, 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 as the real patriots, right? And this is where I meant that there's this ludic element that the left has used for decades in Latin America that has gotten appropriated by the right. But I'm also particularly interested in the relationship between whiteness and anti-democratic ethos in Latin America. And this is unfolding today, but it has deep historical roots. And um, this is sort of linked to uh, questions that George Reed Andrews brought up earlier today, um, which are around the fact that, you know, what democracy looks like in countries that are majority non, non-white and what it means to like forge a democratic project um, in that context means reconciling, reconciling racial and class concerns. And so I don't have much time, but I wanted to give two examples of where I think there's these interesting um, things that are happening that are linking to, uh, whiteness and at least white regions to this anti-democratic project, right? So on the left is the map of the peace referendum in Colombia. Um, and so the red areas are uh, people who voted against peace, and the green areas are the people who voted for peace. Um, and this meant, of course, demobilizing the FARC. You guys will know that uh, the vote against peace actually won um, by a small mar margin, but won. And so the red is the Andean and whiter and more beautiful and more temperate climate part of Colombia, right? Um, and more urban. And ironic, it's also the place where people have been less affected by the violence of, of, of the internal conflict. And so the, what you see in, in uh, the voting on this is that the more rural people, the blacker people, the more indigenous people, who were more directly affected by violence, and specifically by violence of the FARC, actually voted for peace. They voted to demobilize. And so there's this way in which um, there is this, uh, there are two national projects that are um, in tension in this peace referendum that I think also map onto the map from last Sunday that I'm gonna try, I'm not, I'm gonna try not to cry um, and looking at it, but that is the map of the first um, round of the presidential election in Brazil, where we see a similar dynamic of the more underdeveloped, poorer, blacker region of the country um, um, voting against an authoritarian, fascist, um, misogynist, homophobic um, presidential candidate, right? And so there are this, these interesting ways that we might think about um, this in regional ways. Not that every white or mestizo person in this context is voting for fascism, but rather that the regional politics um, of race are linked to a regional politics of authoritarianism and competing ideas about what the future is supposed to look like. And I think while we're at it, if we're to think about whiteness, we should also take a transnational approach, right? Um, we haven't, people who study Brazil have not done the same kind of work that people who study, say, Venezuela have done to think about what the migrants um, are doing <laughs> um, outside because the migrant population is so small. Um, but I actually think that uh, there is this way in which we actually must start to really think about Brazilians abroad. 80% um, of Brazilians in Miami voted for Bolsonaro, for the uh, fascist candidate. Um, and what I find most interesting about this, so this picture was taken in Orlando on Sunday, um, and it's this appropriation of the Make America Great Again, um, but of course, because in their discourse, Brazil has never been quite great, and so it, there's no again at the bottom, right? It's just make Brazil great, right? Um, and you know, the narrative there is that democracy has hampered the abilities 
um, of Brazil to be great. Um, and greatness is measured in, in economic terms almost exclusively, right? But I really think that it's important to kind of think about the uh, convergence of the politics of this that diaspora with Trumpism and with uh, the power of the US in terms of uh, foreign policy in Latin America and to actually not to just write them off and to maybe think about them more critically in the same way that we might think of any of the other Latin American diasporas and how they wreak havoc on, on uh, more democratic politics in the region. In terms of uh, research agenda, and I think Charlie outlined this very well, how much time do I have? Uh, about a minus minute. Minus minute, oh gosh. <laughs> okay, so I'll just wrap up real quick. I think that we should also really take seriously the relationship between race and capital. Not just race and class, but to think systematically about how racialization is, is uh, co-constituted through, through capitalist development. Um, and and we, can own, we can look at land titling as one side of that, right? The third thing um, I believe we need to focus on is really comparison. Um, and I like this idea of relational analysis too because it gets us out of the idea of these just boxes and the ways that uh, these things flow across space. Um, I think that we need to do that using the data that we have, but I think that we need to have uh, like guerrilla style, and I know Tide in Colombia, I can't say that um, without all of the weight of it, but we need to have like a guerrilla style version of doing massive, comparative, relational, data-rich projects um, in the same kind of vein of what Rayad is trying to do, but with even more people. And to, to say, if, you, if the security apparatuses of these countries don't collect data on who dies and who gets killed, then we have to find other ways to do it. Because that has, that, the census only gives you so much in terms of racial data, right? And this has been a long um, demand of the black movement, and it's one of the areas in terms of data collection that has not moved forward. And I think if we focus too much on the census, we, we're missing something really important, right? And finally, I think that we need to work collaboratively, collaboratively across places, but also with activists. I'd love to define a research agenda together with act activists, and we've been doing this, um, but to bring corners of the black movement that don't usually end up in these spaces and think about what the research imperatives are in this moment. And I think that there is also a place, because we're situated in US academia, to kind of think about how we might provide spaces for activists and for scholars to breathe, right? A reprieve from what's going on to kind of reflect and to re-articulate struggles in different ways. And the way um, that we see folks doing here, that we see um, Jim Green and others doing at Brown to kind of say, come here and let's, let, let's have a space where we can kind of uh, uh, work through some of the fatigue around this uh, general assault that's happening. Um, I'm just gonna end there because I'm at minus like five minutes. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> thing today that will make you feel a tiny bit better about the world like the sky falling um, you can go to democracybrazil.org and um, just sign the petition um, that's a, a US based uh, academics um, and it is a, it's a, it's a um, it's a call to defend democracy in Brazil I'll just say that. thank you thank you The good thing about my not knowing anything about Latin America is that I won't pretend to know anything about Latin America. <laughs> I will vamp only long enough for you to come up with your own comments uh, and questions. And it'll be a very brief vamp, which uh, consists of the observation that the, uh, the, the, the phenomena that you describe in Latin America are also becoming more common in Europe uh, and in Russia, where I've spent a, a, which I've visited a number of times. So this seems to be an almost uh, universal uh, phenomenon now. Uh, the, the relationship, the, the drawing much more close of the relationship between race and nation and, of course, power. Okay, questions, comments? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, first question both for uh, Dr. Halen and Dr. Sachel. One thing that you talk about is about uh, how academic people can be uh, partner, a uh, uh, kind of support <coughs> right now. So, 
we have been joking about, we have been laughing about, but we are really scared. We're talking about being scared, and we are. We don't know if the future is going to bring in a new military dictatorship or not, where we are not going to be able to talk anymore. So how Brazilians here in the US who have been for all these years researching, and I know it's not the case of you guys, but uh, in several cases going there, doing research, losing our stories and coming back here. How can these people stand for us now and be our voice if we are going to be in a basement or in a cell without being able to talk, or we are going to be dead like Mario? That's one question. And my other question um, uh, for you, Tiana, that I would like to give it, uh, if you uh, can go over, for example, we have a minority vote in considered underdeveloped uh, areas of Brazil right now. So th who voted for Haddad and was hugely responsible for having him in the second, uh, second round of the election. But on the other hand, we have minority group in cities like Sao Paulo, which I, where I am from, were actually responsible for having Bolsonaro uh, elected and he could win in the first round if we are not like for the Northeast. And minority groups who are not only black, not only indigenous, but a lot of times descendants of people uh, that are from the North and Northeast, I see that on my family, people who are talking about how the Northeast is uh, delayed when actually they are descendants of people from the Northeast. So how is that dynamic? What do you think are the impacts in that dynamic that these minority groups in the peripherias uh, are not identified anymore? Because as an activist and academic, I am trying to wonder where did I fail? Where like we all fail this like our community. How can my neighbors who are actually or my sisters, my siblings who are receiving Bolsa Familia are voting for Bolsonaro. Like people who are like, who don't have like any kind of capital are voting for this man. So what would be your uh, opinion about that? Okay, I'm, I'm going to handle this a little bit differently if I may. I'd like to give uh, the speakers the opportunity to respond question by question. Serious. So please. Uh, thank you so much, Daniela, for your uh, question and for the urgency and emotion in it because these are the times, you know. Um, I I think that, that the first question requires us to actually sit down systematically and have some time to do it. I hope that we can find it here, that we can think about like specific strategies that we might take to actually try in our own way to subvert some of what feels like a horizon of, of straight up old fashioned dictatorship that's happening um, in Brazil. And I, the only thing that comes to mind um, has to do with, with, you know, doing the kinds of statements that we're trying to do here, has to do with providing space. I lie, cheat, and still to get Afro-Brazilian scholars to come to the US. I talk a lot about their English skills that don't always exist um, <laughs> because I, it's very important. I think we have to do more of that. I think we need to pool resources and have even more of that. Um, I, I want to hear from Brazilians what they think we might be able to do from here. I think it's actually time for the kind of advocacy and activism that has been so strong historically in the United States around precisely these same types of issues in Central America um, to actually be um, actually doing the same work in, in Brazil and in, uh, elsewhere. So there is a whole foundation of transnational solidarity. There's a whole foundation of saying, these are our tax dollars that is basically supporting these anti-revolutionary forces and we, we demand some sort of uh, accounting for that. Mm -hmm. Obviously there are limitations to that given what we are living through here. Um, but there's perhaps some room. I think that also, like keeping an eye on Brazil expats is in, or expats migrants is important. Um, I think that the the question around the Northeast is is somewhat of a simple question. I think that if we are to kind of 
understand racial politics in Brazil as individuals, mm -hmm. it doesn't get us very far. I think that if we understand the racial project that's encoded and inscribed and makes meaning through regions and ideas about progress that are regionalized, then we understand. Barbara Weinstein's new book um, that is on the color of modernity and the construction of whiteness in Sao Paulo explains a lot. You move to Sao Paulo, you, it, it's the equivalent of these Brazilians moving to the United States, right? You are invested and you hope to find some dignity in life in, in that modernization project. And so you are on board with the complicated um, and racist agenda that is part of that, right? And you will sacrifice individual freedoms for it, right? It's an instrumentalist um, kind of position, I think. And, and I think it's, it, it's hard to understand it outside of the, you know, what Peter Wade calls the cultural topography of race in that country. That's how I would answer that one. Charles? historical experiences to build on and, and that we need to, to, to really um, call for uh, in, 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 in um, a newly energized way. And, and, and the Central American example I think is important and just to, to be very concrete, um, there was a time when the Latin American Studies Association uh, sent regular de delegations to, to Central America to to explore the, 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 the crises in, in the previous era of, of, of intellectuals um, at risk. And, and that was a very important, it was a whole, it was a whole practice of, of institutional practice of Latin, which then as the, you know, as the times changed, um, fell out of, 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 um, of favor. And, and there's, there's that, I think they were, it was a very powerful statement and not necessarily that anyone read the reports, but the, Existence of of those of those delegations um, is one is one example that comes to mind. I think we need we need our professional organizations to be focused on these issues. Mm -hmm. They already are, but there. But I think that's that's an example of a practice that that, that needs to be uh, be covered. Another is uh, you know the, the, the era of dictatorship in Latin America is an era when foundations, particularly the Ford Foundation and others, were were, were, were very active. In Defending um, uh, intellectuals, and it tended to be elite intellectuals, and there's ways in which uh, those efforts were problematic. But there's, I think there's a there's a real crisis that we, as sectorally, as you know, in academic institutions, um, can can really address. There's also a program which we're actually just trying to get started now at, at UC Santa Barbara that that should be in every single campus of scholars at risk. That is. Is a, is a immediate response for, um, for scholars that have to, that face particular threats, and so I mean I think it's about there's limits to what academic institutions can do. And we have to be we also have to be active at, outside of those institutional uh, limits. But I think there really are ways in which if, if our institutions don't respond to this crisis in, in, in those structured ways, we're we're just not we're not doing our job. I want to turn to uh, to Marcelo. I believe that the term was okay. then has All right. been detained for me, and so I prefer to give uh, the priority to them. Christian, let me let me turn to you next then. Uh, but with the with the observation that universities, at least U.S. universities, are profoundly conservative institutions, uh, conservative by the very way in which knowledge is developed and slowly accepted, but also conservative in a political sense, as Charles and I, having, I've been a dean, I know what it means to beg for money, uh, and Charles is just beginning to, to have that uh, experience. All three of us are connected to public uh, university, which means that we are tethered more or less directly to members of our state legislatures. Now, Kristen, that gave you a chance to formulate. <laughs>
Well, well, let me say that is why other institutions, uh, nonprofit think tanks, uh, came into existence because universities were incapable 